All right, I want to give you guys a math question. Oh, no. <laughs> this is church. No. <laughs> Do you know how many verses in the Bible that God addresses uh, regarding the poor and the marginalized? Okay, don't raise your hand. Okay, and I'm going to give you a multiple choices, okay? okay? Okay, is it from 0 to 10? You know, let's go by log scale instead. That's what I mean, math, you know. So 0 to 9, let's say. And from 10 to 99, or is it 100 to 999, or 1,000 to 9,000 to 9,999, <laughs> and 10,000 to the infinity, right? Just so, okay. So those of you who think from 0 to 9, raise your hand. Okay, from 10 to 99, raise your hand. Okay, be proud. Okay, you can be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> from 100 to 999, raise your hand. Okay, good. And how about 1,000 to 9,999? Okay. There are about 300 okay, verses that addresses regarding the poor and the generalized, the widows and so I think it's very important for us to understand the why we do the overflow. Uh, we've been doing it for the past two years. This is our third year. And it's such a blessing for us to be a channel of God's blessing to everyone around us. Right? Just in, not in San Luis Obispo only, but all over the world. This summer, we're going to go to Mexico. You know, Kenneth and I, we got the visa for Pakistan. We're going to go there. You know, and we're going to go to the Philippines. Right, again, you know, so it's a blessing that God has blessed us so that we can be the channel of blessing. And, and it's, it's amazing that as you are being used by God to be the channel of blessing, God expands you to become a bigger channel of blessing and all the honor and glory goes to Jesus Christ. It's such an honor for us to do that. And so there's some reasons. I'm going to share some verses about these, how God commands us uh, in, the, in the ways that we should uh, care for the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 7 says, If there is a poor man among you, brothers, in any of the towns of the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards your poor brother. Proverbs 31, 8, 9 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the right of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Right? And how God blesses for those who serve the poor. You know, I really believe that there's a God's economy. As you seek his kingdom and his righteousness, God will add on to all the things that you need. You know? And so, you know, I heard Jewish uh, uh, custom, they, their understanding of God is like the sun. Right, the source of everything. And their view of the wealth is like the shadow. Right? So when you run towards sun, what happens? The shadow will follow you. Right? But when you run towards the shadow, what happens? It gets further, further, further away. Right? Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> yeah, Jewish people, man, they're amazing. They're so smart. Even though they have so small in popularity, pop population, but they... You know, uh, not popular. <laughs> <laughs> we love Jews. Amen. Right? And, 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 but they won one third of all the Nobel Prizes. Yeah. And it's amazing. You know, and so Deuteronomy 15 10 says, Give generously to him and do so without a grudging heart. Then, because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hands to. And, and Psalm 41, 1 says, Blessed is he who has regards for the weak. Yeah. The Lord delivers him in times of trouble. You know, and uh, one of my favorite verses uh, in Matthew 25, mm -hmm. it talks about how we treat the least of this world. And uh, the way that we treat the least in this world, that's how we treat Jesus. You know that, right? It doesn't matter what you say. You say, I love Jesus. But the way you treat the least in this world, 
that's how you need to do this. Mm -hmm. That's just the bottom line, you know? And so it's not just the poor and the needy, but even brothers and sisters, you know, sometimes we're kind of so comfortable, and to your wife too, right? Or your husband, sometimes we get so used to them being near what is that. So we just kind of take that for granted, and I think uh, we should really evaluate you know, all the ways that we treat everyone around us. And that's how we need to treat Jesus, including those of us, right, the, the least in this world. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, from Mark chapter 9, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, because uh, in the beginning of Mark chapter 9, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to a Mount of Transfiguration and experiences this amazing miracle. You know, and so after experiencing God, and now they're coming back down the mountain, and even though they experience this high spiritual, like like a retreat. You know how you go to retreats and you get really high with the Lord, and you, you want to you can die for Christ, and you, you want to go to Africa or, or India or just other, you know, the dumpiest place in this world to serve Christ, right? So when you come down from the retreat, then the reality sets in. And, uh, you know, all these troubles. And this is exactly what that is look, looking like. And there was this man, right, with a boy who had a uh, demon possession and maybe like an epileptic kind of disease. And disciples could not heal these people. And then, you know, this problem is there and it kind of goes on from there. So I want to share with you three essentials to overcome our, our unbelief because... At the very last scene, right, the line I'm going to read is that when Jesus tells him, if you believe, right, everything is possible. And the man says, the dad says, I believe, but help my unbelief. You know, when I read that line, what does it exactly mean? It's kind of, right, perplexing to me, I'm sure to all of you, to understand what it means to, I believe, but help my unbelief. I think we all live in that land, right? Right? Maybe we want to believe, we want to believe more, right? And so we want to kind of unpack that and really get down to three essentials to overcoming our belief or strengthening our believing and also overcoming our unbelief. Let, let's read the text first, all right? Let's read it. Ready? Go. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw him, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with him about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked the disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, he immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. He has often thrown into the fire or water to but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. You can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my own belief. Now, that's a very interesting line. I, I love that line. So three essential things to overcome uh, is strengthening our belief system and overcoming our belief is this. Right? And first of all, I want to question, ask you a question. Who has a problem in our text? Who, who has a problem? Who, who? The, the, the boy has a problem, right? As a major problem, he has a sickness. Whatever it is, demon possession, conversion, epilepsy, right? Whatever it is, he has a problem, right? Do you see anyone else who has a problem? Disciples had a problem too, because Jesus has given him the authority to heal, right? but he could not heal. Right? Do you see any other problem? Dad had a problem too, right? Right? Because it's like, Dad, you know, your son has a problem, that's your problem. Right? And so it's not like only the son's problem, but because of dad's relationship with the son, which is the son's dad, and so he has a problem too. 
right? Well, who else has a problem? You know, crowd has a problem too. They're crowd gathering, right? They could not do anything. They're just watching, right? And so when you look at all these things, I think that's our problem, right? Some of us has a real problem, right? And some of them has somebody related to that problem who has a problem. And somebody is like, we're just watching, like, wow, we have a problem. <laughs> you know, some of us, we, uh, we know what to do. We have a solution, but it, it's not working out. We try, we pray, we, we read the Bible, and we seek counsel, but it's not helping out. Right? And so I think all of us has a problem. So Malcolm Mugridge, right, he says, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time, the most intellectually resisted fact. You know, so what I'm saying is that we're living in a simple world. We are. You know, in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't this kind of sin. They, you know, they're just cruising around with Jesus and God, right? They were just hanging around with them, just eating. They didn't have, they didn't have to work. Those of you who hate work, you know, like all of us, right? See, you know, because of our sin, we have to go work, right? <laughs> you know, it could be in the love boat, you know, like, you know, try to stay far us. Far away from the you know the, the knowledge of good and evil, tree from that, right? We can just eat grapes, strawberries, pomegranates, or whatever you want to eat, and just enjoy your time with Eve or, or Adam, right? But because of sin, we have to go work. Give your prime time, eight to six o'clock or eight to five, to somebody else, right? Not your wife, not your husband, right? Wouldn't it be great if we go back to that? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> because of the sin problem, we have to do this. You have to study hard. Right? You have to you learn something about engineering or economics or accounting so you can go find a job. Right? <laughs> right? But because of this sinful problem, then we can all agree, right? It is empirically verifiable. It is. Right? You know, like in California now, they're going to have a boys' bathroom and a girls' bathroom and maybe a third bathroom for those people who are confused. Like, you know, the boy, maybe they feel like they're a girl, and then they have to make another bathroom, right? Or something like that. So now they're in the court of how do we realize those things. You know, even last Friday, even for me too, it's not just people out there, just all of us, we have a problem. You know, like Mion gave me a, this chocolate thing. You know, and instead of just saying thank you, and I'm thinking all these things, you know, like what's in this thing, you know, like, you, know, you know, I'm trying to lose weight, and can't you see, you know? And, and so in my thinking, I say something really dumb, right? And so it, it's, it's, you just realize that, right? Don't you guys have a problem like that? I do. We all do. You know, the Bible says that men ought to love their wife as Christ loved the church and give, give himself up for her, right? But do we do that? Maybe when you get married, right? When, you know, I remember when, when the before you know, in the beginning she got we got married and she kind of coughs, right? Oh, honey, you okay? You know, like you want some water? But, but then if, after several years, like she coughs, then you just kind of turn around and pretend like you didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? You know, those of you not married yet, you will. And so we're like that. And that's how simple we are. Yeah, we're so simple. It's, you know, it's, it's verifiable big time, right? But then what happens? We intellectually resist that. We say, oh, no, that's not a real. Everybody does that. Well, everybody does that. Does it make it right? No, right? It doesn't make it right. So that's our problem. We have to understand that there's, we have a big problem. The boy has a problem. Father has a problem. Disciple has a problem. The crowd has a problem. We all have a problem, right? So what he's saying is that we need to realize the the need, the problem, you can say the problem. We need to realize that. You need to understand how depraved we are. How we fall short of God's glory. There is a fine, defined mark for us that God wants us to live. But how we do it? Because of our sinful nature, we miss the mark. We transgress against God's decrees. So something that God tells us to do, there's something in us saying, I don't want to do it. We want to Right? Fight against God. And we want to play God. That's our problem. You know, there's a physically, we have a problem. You know, sometimes I watch NBA, man, I want to, I am not 6'3 or 6'10. I want to be able to dunk. Right? Right? You know, not just go to elementary school and dunk. Why would I be like, you really 10 feet? 10 feet from the, even like elementary school, that I can barely dunk, you know, with the tennis ball. <laughs> but with the basketball, you know. But emotionally, I'm so 
so emotionally not healthy. Like I remember, like beginning of my pastoring years, you know, I was, you know, usually when pastors speak, they give you water, right? So I was coughing that day, and my wife gave me a cup of water, and guess what I said? Again, I didn't say thank you to her. I just said, I don't need it, honey. You know? I'm like, oh. And after that, I, you know, like all the Korean ladies said to me, like, Pastor, like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you should just take it and say thank you. I said, oh, emotionally, I'm kind of messed up. You know, my father died when I was nine years old. I'm not blaming that. But because of our sinful nature, sinful world that we're living in, we're all messed up. Right? Spiritually, too. Right? We think we're better than God. And I'll kind of unpack that a little bit later. Right? Personally. Then, you know, we're, we're all messed up personally, and when you look at others, they're all messed up too. I remember one time we were trying to figure out the name of our church. Journey, we had a competition, right? And so people say, oh yeah, you submit your names, we have a voting, oh yeah, that's all right. So then one day, we, we took a vote, and uh, one, you know, I was reading, counting the vote, right? And one man, right, he uh, wrote, he put on the third box, right? I think we had two runner-ups, right? And, uh, Journey of Christian Fellowship and New Hope, something like that, right? And the and third, he, he, he created a third box all by himself and said, I have a problem. And I know exactly what he was saying, you know? And I called him, I said, oh, I like that name too. I have a problem, church. I knew exactly. So I asked him, like, well, what's, the, what's the issue? What do you think? He goes like, oh, what about those people who weren't here? And they don't get to vote. I said, you know, I, I know what you're saying. I know your concern. That's why I all called them. I emailed them. I contacted them. So that I, see, he only knew whatever was happening, but he didn't know what else was happening. Too. So you know what I'm saying? I have a problem, church. Amen? You know, we all have a problem. We do. You know, talk to your neighbors and, you know, I have a problem. And so do you. <laughs> Does it feel good? Especially the soothing part. Volunteers, we need in volunteers. Those people who need to come from 5:30 p.m. till 6:30 a.m. They're gonna have to overnight to care for those homeless people, homeless families. They will be coming here, pray for them, to right, to minister to them, to talk with them, to be their friend, right? And they be sleeping. You still can. You can still pray for them too. Right? It would be a great opportunity for us. And you need to sign up. You can come come talk to me to sign up. Please do. And those of us from our church, I really want you to come between 6 to 9 p.m. And while they're awake, you can be their friend. You can talk to them. You can ask them questions. You can pray for their circumstantial needs. And last year, I remember this man, you know, he said, I need a job. I said, okay, let me pray for you. Right? He, has, he said he has an interview tomorrow. Right? We pray for them. Next day, he got the job. Praise the Lord, right? Right? You know, it's good so for him to understand that God thinks about us. God loves us. God is mindful of us. Right? We experience that all the time. Right? Also missional. The things that God told us to do. That we should live with the mission that God has given us to make disciples of all nations. Not just here, but here and abroad and all over the world. How are we doing that? You know, I, I know if you go to perspective class and they say if you have a mission program in your church, your church is not missional. Because it's not just a program. It's your lifestyle. It's your bread and butter, right? If we don't do that, if you just have a program to do mission, that is a problem. Right? And all of us, we are royal priesthood. Do you believe that? You know? Holy Spirit lived in you. And you are to live like Christ to make disciples of all, you know, all nations. And if you don't have that mindset, if you don't right, think that's, that's your mission, we have a problem. That's why we have services all the time to remind us the mission that God has given us, right? You know, I'm so proud of my son today. And, you know, I said, last night, I said, AJ, make sure you bring this bag, okay? This thing goes to Uncle Kenneth. All these other things goes to the shins. AJ, don't forget. That's your mission, right? And this morning, AJ brings a little bag. You know, I said, good job, son, <laughs> right? You guys have a mission, amen? amen? Don't forget that. To make disciples of all nations. 
you know, Christians, non-Christians, you don't care who they are, right? Your job is for them to take a closer step to Jesus Christ, wherever they are. And if we forget that, we have a problem, which we do, right? You know, we're so inward focused, right? We're just all about our church, four walls of this church, everything happens inside. No, what about the outside? What about people, your, your, your classmates, your, your co-workers, your neighbors, right? your relatives? We are to make disciples of all nations. That's why we need to realize the need, the problem. That's our first uh, essential. The second essential is uh, we need to understand that who is the central person of this story. And of course, right, in church, any question goes out, uh, Jesus Christ is the answer. Right? He is the, he's the central person of the Bible. He's a central person in history. That's why we have A.D. and B.C. before Christ and Anno Domini, right, after the Lord kind of thing, right? So he breaks the history in half in a way, before Christ and even after Christ, right? So he is a central person of this story, of everything, even in your life. He is the central person. And so, you know, what what we need to do is that we need to tell something, right? So I'm going to ask you, Tell us something about Jesus Christ. What do you know about Jesus Christ? I, I, one of my favorite professors says that if you know more about, you know, when I was growing up, it was, uh, you know, Michael Jordan. But if you know more about Kobe Bryant or, or LeBron James, you know, or, or, or what are some famous, like, you know, <laughs> Jeremy Lin, right, or any other, like, musicians, right, you know, like Britney, Nicole, or whatever, you know, <laughs> right? Right? If you know more about them than Jesus Christ or Apostle Paul, we have a problem. Right? And people are going to ask you, what did you learn today? I mean, I have a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. That's good. Right? Tell us something about this person. Who do you know about Jesus Christ? Compassionate. Compassionate. Amen. What else? Sacrificial. Sacrificial. He died. He rose again. Comforter. Right? He's a comforter. Yeah. Good. What else? Yeah, you need to know about these things. And you don't just need to learn about these kind of things. Just Google them, right? You know, Anna said it was like 180 things about God, and Jesus is all that. Right? If we need to write that down, we need to learn more about those kind of things. Who is Jesus Christ? Right? So I want to share a verse with you. Yeah, I learned this in seminary. The preeminence of Jesus Christ. How he is the everything, right? And so, when you read that again, he is the image of the invisible God. He's the very nature of God. And he shows us who God is. If you have any questions about God, you look at Christ. Right? Then you get to know who God is. Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Right? right? So he's an, invisible, he's an image of invisible God. The first one of all creation. He's a preeminent one. He's the supreme one. For by him all things were created. All the things that you see in this world, it was created by Jesus. Right? Amen? Right? Created by him things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or, or authorities. All things were created by him and what? For him. Teenagers, you cannot say, this is my life. I do whatever I want to do. You are not created for yourself. You were created by you know, or, or, you know, by God, but manufactured by your parents, you know, and they're not for you, it was for Christ. He is before all things, and in, in Him, all things hold together. He holds together. He's the sustainer. If He kind of relaxes and like, oh, I'm tired, then bam, everything is going to fall to the ground, right? And, but He never is at rest. He puts everything together. He holds things together, and in Him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, meaning the church. He is the beginning and the first form from among the dead, that in everything he might have the supremacy, supremacy of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things that when you go to a spirit-filled church, right, it's not all speaking in tongues, it's not all about healing and miracles. You know what they talk about? They talk about Jesus. Right? It's not just all the, you know, signs and wonders. It's about Jesus. And if you are filled with the Spirit, you will talk about Jesus because Spirit is all about Jesus. He do not, you know, draw attention to himself, but it's all about Jesus. Right? And so, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And though he 
right? Through him to reconcile to himself all things, right? He's talking about he died and he rose again to reconcile our relationship with God and us, right? And so we need to learn something about Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He is all, all things were created by him and all things were created for him. Do you live your life as though that you were created for him? Amen? Right? At least that's what we want to run towards to. Right now, maybe I may not be, but I want to be there where I my, my life is all about Jesus. Right? Even you can go to work. Yeah, you should go to work. But when you go to work, your life is all about Jesus. Working hard for the Lord. Amen? Right? You want to be the best work you can be. Best worker you can be. So when you're gone, people will miss you. Man, that guy was a good worker. That's why he was a Christian. You know what I'm saying? Now I'm like, oh, I'm glad that guy's gone. <laughs> you know, he was a terrible worker. As a Christian, that's sin. You know, you got to do your best. Amen? Right? Because you're not working for the CEO or whoever, but what you're working for the Lord, the preeminent one, the supreme one. Very, very important. He is the central person. Right? So we need to run to the one. Run to the one. Run to the one that who can fill our needs. Run to the one that who knows our problem. Run to the one that who can, right, who can fix us. Right? And so you need to run to him. And, and you know, he is available. You see the text, right? He's available. Right? He gets, he gets a little bit kind of angry at people because you still don't know who I am. You still don't know what I can do. You still don't realize the authority that God has given on you. You still are so yourselves. You guys are still fighting over who is the supreme and who is better than the other or not. You're so self-centered, selfish, and self-oriented, self-absorbed, that you're forgetting about Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus is saying to them. And he's willing. Right? And so many times, and they, 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 Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? Then he says, you know, I mean, right? It's kind of funny that Jesus, like, Jesus runs into these people who's blind. Right? What do you want me to do for you? And people who are blind say, can't you see? I can't. <laughs> right? But he said, I want to see. Right? You see, it's so profound respect that Jesus had to them. Jesus doesn't assume anything. Right? He says, what do you want me to do? I want to see. Right? They say, okay. You know? And said, I'm willing. And be healed. So he's willing and he has power because, you know, we read the Colossians verse. He created everything. He knows the, all the <laughs> laws of this nature and he can work outside of this world's nature, you know, the law of nature. So he can heal many different ways. He can use doctors to heal. He can use like regular way of the, but he can use supernatural ways of healing as well. Right? And so he is willing and he has power to do that. And so how do we run to Christ? A lot of times I say this a lot, right? Gospel-centered life is not legalism. It's not, you know, free life. You do whatever you want, but it's running towards Jesus. And how do we run towards Jesus, right? And it means having a loving relationship with Jesus, right? It's a connection with Jesus. It's knowing Jesus and God knowing you. It's a, it's a, it's a real thing. So when I take you guys to lunch or dinner or a coffee, we get to know each other, Right? You know, you know I, I got to spend like 12, uh, 14 hours with Irvin, Sheeran, and Megumi. We had to go down to get my passport for my visa. You know, and I didn't know, but Sheeran has two other names. You know? You know? She does. The real kind of like illegal names. It used to be. You know, like, wow, I didn't know that. Right? So we get to know each other, right? <laughs> but about God, same thing. As you relate to the person, you get to know God. How more exciting is there? You get to know Almighty God. Let's say you found out something about Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan or whatever. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be exciting? Bubba Watson, not like Bubba Watson golfer, you know? I'd be so excited. Kobe Bryant, like, yeah, did you know Kobe Bryant? You know, like, about this or that. I'd be so excited. But about God, you get to know. You get to have a loving relationship with him. What does that mean? You have fellowship with him. You follow Christ. You experience life change. But you need to change. And also Jesus' mission. And some of us, I think we elevate Jesus' mission, right? But we don't elevate your life change. But you know, life change is so, so crucial. How we grow in our holiness. God has been speaking to me this, this a lot. How we, need, we must grow in our holiness. You know, more than the way we follow Jesus' mission. 
Because due to submission, we have said we're doing it, but our holiness is not supporting that. Whatever we do, right? It, in a way, it kind of degrades the things that we do. But then all the things that we do, it needs to be supported by our holiness. In the ways that we grow like Jesus Christ. In the ways that God changes us. Right? You know, that past week, we were coming back from L.A., I was hearing this, you know, this, this sermon about, you know, sexual immorality. You know, how the Jewish council wrote to the people in the Gentiles how they were accepting Christ or spirit was overcoming them, right? And, and they give those specific four things. And, and, and the preacher was saying, like, how amazing it is. How they, the Gentile who did not grow up in this religious setting, but first rung of spiritual maturity included sexual immorality. But how many of us, we, I even me, how many of us, we kind of right, right, rush in that very easily and say, oh, you know what, men are only saved in a waist up. Right? I mean, we, we just kind of easily brush us out those kind of things and saying, God can do amazing things to overcome the problems that we have. He's more than conqueror, amen? He doesn't just cleanse the sins, but help us to conquer the sins. Not that, I'm not talking about sinless perfection, but we must grow in holiness to reflect his character and his, you know, his, his, his personhood in our lives as well, right? I mean, so we have major problems. We do. Yeah. So, so follow in the ways that we experience life change and Jesus' mission. So the third thing, right? Oh, it's not third thing. Yeah. So application, how do we want to, yeah, you gotta run, run toward, heading towards a loving relationship with Jesus. What do you do? Right? You <laughs> read the Bible, pray, have one with other followers, and you evangelize. And when I accepted Christ, like many, many, many moons ago, more than 24 years ago, right? And somebody, late, some lady took me downstairs. Like, oh, we were in the other church, you know, time ago, right? And this lady says, oh, you know what? Heaven is rejoicing. She told me all that. But now, like, you are a new creation. And she instructed me, right? She instructed me and said, okay, now you need to read the Bible every day. Pray every day. Tell people about Christ every day. Right? And fellowship with Christians every day. She gave me four specific instructions. But nowadays, oh, everything's okay, you know? No problem. We don't need any instructions. We're so grace-oriented. Yeah, God will do whatever he needs to do in your life. Right? You know how many instructions that we have in the Bible? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Probably like 99.9%, you know? you know? It's all instructions. But we neglect that. It's not instructions. It's just suggestions. If you feel like you do it, it's okay. God will empower you to do that. Right? So it's a little bit wrong theology. God gives us instructions. I'm giving you instructions as a believer, as a first one of maturity. Read the Bible every day. Do you read the Bible every day? We ought. Right? Do you pray? Right? Not just even before your meals, but like getting on your knees and praying, crying out, I have a problem, Lord. If you don't show up, man, I'm going to be in deeper problems. You know? Right? Right? Really putting your neck out on the line so that asking people, we're praying for you too. Right? Right? Lord, if you don't give us our visa, I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> We've been praying that five, five months. You know? Okay, we're getting out. I'm not getting stressed, but you know, Kenneth is because that's his girlfriend over there, you know. My wife's here, so yeah, I'm okay. Like, hey. <laughs> pray and hang with other Christians, other followers, and saying, like, oh, what are you you're struggling with? My prayer request is this. Man, I need your prayer. Can you pray for me? Can you lay hands on me? Right? And you know, you buy me coffee and I pray, or whatever it is, you know, you need to hang with other Christians. Right? And also you need to tell people about Christ. And because as you tell people, and I, learned, I watched this Kung Fu movie yesterday, my son was watching, he said, you know, this like, master monkey comes to him and says, oh, everything you do is Kung Fu. So he's doing dishes as like he's doing Kung Fu, you know, ah, you know, like that. <laughs> right? For, for real, for all your life, everything you do is spiritual. Did you know that? Everything you do is a relationship with Christ. You talk to your wife, talk to your husband, talk to your friend, talk to your son, talk to your mom, whatever, whatever it, is, it, it, it is, your spiritual life, right? How you handle your roommate situations, you know, how you serve at home, like, oh man, my roommate didn't do washing dishes again, you know? 
Tell them then. Go to the dishes. Whatever you need to do, how do you treat Jesus and how are you going to do that? Right? right? So the third essential is that we need to define the belief system right. So it's not limited to cognitive agreement. A lot of times we think like, oh, as long as we agree to something, we're believing. That's not like that. This is the kind of Western world of thinking like that. But in the biblical sense, believing is an alignment of a whole person. Your whole person needs to come in alignment with a person of Jesus Christ. Then you're believing. Yeah. Right? So it's like, it's like this man is saying, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And I think I can you know, re restate that if I'm the father, I would say, I do believe, but help me to believe more. You know? I want to believe more. I want to believe better. I want to have a better connection. I want to have a better alignment. You know, when your car will know how to alignment, like, da, 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 right? Right? I want to have a better alignment to, I know, knowing where you want to go, what you want me to do, and really follow you better in that sense. So, so in that sense, what is the difference between what I, what I believe versus <laughs> what I believe? <laughs> right? And this is our Western world. What I believe is so much more important than what I, I believe. Not that with the attitude, like what, you know, right? But it's the important, so this is emphasizing the object, the person of who we're believing. This is what? Emphasizing me. See, see this, this reality of truth, right, it, it, it's, it's beyond us, right? It's outside of us. Even your connection with that reality is, is, is within yourself. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about I. I'm, not to, I'm talking about this real, truth of reality that resides outside of you. The person of Christ. Just because you know this much of Christ, is Christ only that much? No. Christ is infinite. Right? He's infinitely valuable. He's so wonderful. He's full of wonder. Right? So I'm, ta I'm talking about how that needs to be so much more emphasized than I. What I believe Yes, it's important, but what is more important than what I believe, right? I, I want you to see this. The Christian logic is Jesus, you know, I, you got to be just careful now, right? Because all the things I capitalize and those things are very, very meaningful something. See, Jesus is truth regardless we believe him or not. <laughs> so I must believe in him. Do you see that? But the, the world logic, right, is this. Jesus is a truth regardless we believe him or not. But I, I don't believe him, so I cannot believe him. <laughs> Did you see the difference? <laughs> right, one is emphasizing me. The world logic, right, or non-Christian's logic is emphasizing me. Me, my belief, my connection with him. But the Christian logic is emphasizing on Jesus. He's truth, reality of truth. Regardless I believe or not, he's there. He is loving. He is compassionate. He is all that. He is preeminent one. He is supreme one. And so me knowing that, right, me understanding that, what do we do? I mean, I want to run towards that. I want to grow him. I want to align myself to that. Regardless I believe it or not. Right? The object of truth is already residing outside. Oh, where are you? <laughs> yeah. See, he knows it. Right? He says, move on. Right? right? So focus is different. Right? Jesus versus me. You, you need to get this. When you talk to people who are struggling, who has an issue with doubt, yes, we all doubt. But then, is your focus on the doubt? Or you focus on the person of Christ? That's what I'm saying. I'm yelling too much, okay? I have to calm down. <laughs> right? So what, what is this? It's a resolve to believe. You have to resolve. To, based on that, we have to resolve to believe, knowing the person of Jesus Christ. Right? And depending on, trusting. That's what believing means. Trusting, depending, relying, and cling on to the person of Christ. That's all means believing. Right? It's depending on, man, I don't have him, I die. I don't trust him, I die. I perish. I don't rely on him. Right? You know, before, my, my, you know, I, I, maybe like five years ago, people would say, you Christians are weak. You use Christ like you use like your crutch. And when I hear that, I don't like it. You know, just like something pride in me, right? Comes out like, what do you think you are, man? You know, you want to take it outside? <laughs> you know, I know, I know, versus that you do, right? Whatever it is. But then, you know what? I realized what it means to believe. 
I don't just agree with them then, but I agree with them even more. You know what? Jesus is not my crutch. He's my stretcher. Without him, I can do nothing. That sounds like a Bible verse song. <laughs> Amen? Right? Depending on him, trusting him, relying on him, and cling on the person of Christ. And right, becoming like the person of Christ. As you grow, you're going to become like him. And there's no any exciting news than that. That God lives in us and make us to become like him. And we need to humble ourselves and run towards to relationship, loving relationship with Jesus Christ every moment. Every moment, every waking moment, every breathing moment. All the things that you do, you do the honor of him. You do the for the glory of God. Right? You take every moment to run towards him. You're not just doing it for the world, but you're doing it for Christ. That's how we need to live in this life. That's how you can overcome your unbelief. Understanding the truth is outside of us and is way bigger than who, who you are and your connection with the truth. Right? Just know that. Right? For example, like if I know some, I know the, I don't know the words, definition of word, what do I do? I go get a dictionary. Right? And you open the dictionary, oh, belief means this. And who, you're going to say, like, what, this guy doesn't know Webster. He doesn't know, you know, what he's talking about. Who says that? But we say it all the time. But we say that to God all the time. Right? In a spiritual life, right? And regarding Jesus Christ, the Bible is it. Believe the Bible. This is outside of us. Regardless of what this says, this is the truth. Right? Run towards that. And that's how you strengthen your belief system and overcome your unbelief. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's take offering. Offering is not just giving your money to him, but it's giving your life. It's alignment to him. Okay? Alignment to the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Sunday service we have it in our multi-purpose room. Right? So a little bit of different experience um, that start the whole month of May and also first Sunday of June uh, that time. Alright? So rise and you pray for us and you know, for this service. Father God, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Father, we recognize and we realize we have all kinds of issues and problems. It's because of our sinful nature and the sin in this world. Uh, you did not intend that, but because of our pride, because of uh, our selfish nature, uh, selfishness, that we experience that sin and we experience again and again the cycle of sin in our lives. We thank you so much for you sending your son Jesus Christ to die for that so that you can cleanse us of our sins and so that we can have loving relationship with you and also your power that dwells in us through your spirit of Jesus Christ that we can overcome, we can conquer, that we can be more like you each day as we live. Father, we acknowledge that you reside outside of our realm 
our small and finite realm, that you are infinite, infinitely glorious, infinitely valuable and worthy. Help us to understand that. Help us to align ourselves in totality with that true reality. Each day, each moment that we're alive today, help us to understand that, help us to run towards that, and help us to resolve and determine to believe you that is written in your scripture. Thank you so much. Empower us with your spirit today and the rest of our days so that we can run to you, we can experience your grace and your power working in us and through us to be more like you, to be a salt and light, to be a city on a hill in this city, this state, and this world. Father, we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a great Sunday. God bless you all. Thank you.